Welcome to my shop. Today we're going to look at the electrolytic capacitor and we're going to cover what is considered to be a practical approach to how to test an electrolytic capacitor. Electrolytic capacitors can be found in a multitude of locations in industry as well as in your own home. Here's a prime example. I've got a single phase induction motor and you notice around the circular body I've actually got this protrusion here on the side. This houses a start capacitor. And I'm going to take you through this practical approach based off of the tools an electrical worker or an electrician would have with them on a daily basis. So stay tuned. What we're going to do next is we're going to take a tour around my workshop and we're going to examine all the pieces of equipment that actually has a capacitor attached to it. So let's take a walk. Here at the table saw, this is a two horsepower motor and we can see by this protrusion it actually cut, does come equipped with a capacitor. So that's number one. Here at the dust collector, machine number two. Two horsepower motor wired for 240 volts. It does come equipped with a capacitor. Here at the bandsaw, not only does this motor come equipped with a start capacitor, it also has a run capacitor. Machine number three. This drum sander, start capacitor. This is also wired for 120 volts. This is my drill press. It plugs into a 120 volt power source and it too has a capacitor. Here at my jointer, I've removed the access door and we can see I have a fairly large motor here, two horsepower, and it too comes equipped with a start capacitor. This is a 60 gallon air compressor. It's plugged into a 240 volt power source and this motor actually has two capacitors, much like the bandsaw. One capacitor is for starting, one capacitor is for running to help bring about power factor correction. Let's go through some aspects of a capacitor that need to be tested. Again, I'm trying to supplement from a textbook, but I found that there is a few things missing from the textbook. Number one, you should always conduct a visual test. When we look at a capacitor, this body could become deformed. It could, if, um, if it got too hot, or the electrolytic fluid that's encased inside of this could have gotten out. That could affect it whether or not the capacitor is actually charging or discharging. So the first thing we should always do is, let's examine it. Let's do a visual test. Number two, our second step is continuity testing. Specifically, we have two ends here. One's considered to be the anode, one's considered to be the cathode. I want to test anode to ground. While I'm referring to ground, I'm actually talking about the body. These uh, two leads, the anode and the cathode, should not have any type of continuity with the body. If we found that there was continuity, that would indicate that I have a shorted capacitor and it's no good. Now you'll notice that I don't have another test listed, anode to cathode. That's step three. Step three, the dielectric test. This is where we start testing the anode to the cathode. Here, you're going to see continuity. Not because the two plates are shorted together, but because of the fact that inside of here, it sits within some dielectric fluid. Because of that, you're going to see continuity. So I'm checking for the capacitor's ability to accept a charge and its ability to discharge. Now, we're gonna to go to the bench and we're gonna do a comparison. I've got a good capacitor and I've got one that I know has been damaged. And we're gonna do a comparison of the two so that we can see the values that we wanna see compared to the values of a bad capacitor and how we could distinguish between the two. Now, we've got a, a typical motor, single phase, plugs into a 120 volt power source. It does come equipped with a capacitor. So before we jump into testing, there's a few things we need to make sure of. One, if I'm gonna test a capacitor, it actually has to be uh, separated or 
disconnected from the equipment. In this case, I would actually have to take the cover screws off, pull the cover off, expose the capacitor, and then carefully I would disconnect it from the circuit, as you can see here. Now, we're not going to test this capacitor because I've got other ones right here. But safety is always going to be the first thing we're going to do. As well, before grabbing a capacitor, <clears throat> we don't know if the capacitor has already been charged. Capacitors have the ability of discharging themselves very, very quickly, and they can become quite dangerous. In order to do this, what we need to do is just take a regular screwdriver from your pouch, and we're going to short out the leads. Now, the capacitor I'm using for today's demonstration is a little bit different. It comes from a piece of refrigeration equipment, and it is known as a dual capacitor. And you can see it right here on the box. A dual capacitor. What is different here is that I've actually got two capacitors inside of this body. There is a common point and it is labeled as a C. One is marked for the fan, another one for the compressor. And so I've actually got two different values for microfarad. On this one in particular, I have for the fan, five microfarads. And for the compressor, I have 30 microfarads. So we're actually going to be testing two capacitors today. How do I go about uh, discharging it? As I said earlier, you take your screwdriver and I go between the common and the fan. And I'm basically going to short out the anode to the cathode, discharging the capacitor. I will do the exact same thing for the second capacitor and discharge. This way, I'm not going to get any unpleasant surprises. Now, our first step is going to be visual verification or testing. Now, here on the left, I've actually got a capacitor. It's brand new out of the box. It is in pristine condition. What you won't see is any kind of deformation on the bottom of the can or on the top. Here on the right, look at this capacitor. We can see plainly that the whole top has bubbled out. This capacitor has been damaged. I suspect that we're going to get very false, false readings here uh, in terms of am I going to measure any kind of capacitance? I doubt it, but this is what we're trying to demonstrate today. So looking at it, obviously I've got a bulge and a deformation. That leads me to believe that maybe the seal here has broken and some of the electrolytic fluid has leaked out. I can confirm, because I've actually diagnosed this capacitor uh, a while back, and I, when I opened up the cabinet, I actually found dielectric fluid in the bottom of the cabinet. So it was very easy to troubleshoot because of the fact there was a, a telltale indication the capacitor was deformed, and I actually saw some electrolytic fluid leaking out of it. Let's move on to the actual testing with a meter. You'll notice I've got two multimeters in front of me, one analog, one digital. What's the best tool in this particular situation for te uh, checking a capacitor? Almost everybody has got a digital multimeter in their kit. Unfortunately, it is not considered to be the best tool when it comes to testing a capacitor. Now, you may be wondering why. Well, the reason is, is that these multimeters have what we call a liquid crystal display. And this liquid crystal display cannot keep up with the changing information. If you were to use a digital multimeter, what you would see is during the capacitor's charging and discharge time, the numbers, or the numerical value, would be changing so quickly that you wouldn't be able to get an accurate reading. And for that reason alone, the digital multimeter is not the best choice. So we're going to set that aside. We're going to use an old-fashioned analog meter. One of the reasons is it's actually got an analog or a Darson valve movement. It is a little bit slower, but what I'm going to be using is I'm going to be looking at the rate of change or the speed at which the needle is going to travel will indicate how fast the capacitor is charging and or discharging, but also the fact that the way an analog meter works, it actually has a built-in 9-volt battery. 
that battery is actually going to be used to charge the capacitor and it's going to discharge it. So we're actually going to be using the internal battery inside of this machine to see and verify whether or not the capacitor's uh, ability to charge and discharge does function. Now I'm going to set this up. I have a set of leads here and thank God everything's color coded so we're going to set the red probe for the resistance the black probe on the common and I'm going to set it up and I'm going to see if my camera person can zoom in here. Now we're going to take a moment and we're going to calibrate the display on our analog meter. We have it set for 1k ohm. Both of the leads are plugged in and we're going to put our two leads together. Now we can see that the display does not go full scale and that's why we have this little potentiometer here on the face. This allows us to make slight adjustments and to zero out our display. Now that's what we're looking for. Now we're ready to start taking some readings. So we're going to start off with here uh, our capacitor on the left and I'm going to check between the common and ground. So I can touch anywhere on the body and if you're looking at the display you'll notice that there is no deflection of the needle. Now all leads have to be checked and I've got nothing. So that means then I do not have continuity or I don't have any of the plates that have gone to ground. This is a good thing. Now let's do a comparison. Here's the common and again we're going to the body and I'm seeing nothing on the needle but we're also going to check every one of our plates and I saw no deflection. So I right now I don't have any telltale indication other than that this body's deformed to tell me that one capacitor may be damaged compared to another one. So what we've tested is the anode to ground and we've tested cathode to ground. Our last step is going to be a dielectric test. Now that's where we're going to test the anode to the cathode. In this case with the common and right here I'm going to be touching it to the fan and you'll see I've got no reading whatsoever now I'm going to go to the compressor terminal and do the same thing I've got no reading whatsoever as far as I'm concerned this capacitor cannot charge or discharge but let's do a comparison to another capacitor here is the common and I'm going to test to the fan what I should see is that the needle is going to deflect upwards or upscale and it's rather quick I'm not sure if anybody caught that I'm going to do it again but now I'm going to move to the second capacitor that is labeled for the compressor now this is 30 microfarads and there's an important thing I want to mention the amount of deflection that we will observe in the needle is directly proportional to the microfarad value you are testing in this case I tested for five microfarads and I saw that the needle went to about the 30 scale. Here at 30 microfarads it's my expectation I expect that this needle is going to jump up much higher and let's take a look and there was a much higher amount of deflection. Now what about discharging? Well if I was to reverse the polarity of my test probes and inverse them what you're going to see is that the capacitor actually charged itself up when I did the first initial test. When I reverse the polarity now, I'm going to make and complete a circuit, the capacitor is going to discharge itself, and then it's going to charge itself back up. So what am I going to see? I'm going to see a deflection of about twice the value that we recorded previously, and then I'm going to see the needle coming back down. When it's swinging down, that's the period of time in which it is actually charging itself up. Ready? Let's see. And we saw that the needle deflected full scale and what was happening is that 
when the needle was traveling back, it was actually what we would call an RC time constant, meaning that as the capacitor was nearing its higher charge, the slower the needle was moving at this end of the scale. Let's do this again, but with the 5 microfarad capacitor, which is between the common and the fan. And let's observe this again. And if I was to repeat it one last time, I'm going to reverse the polarity of my leads and charge and discharge. So there you have it. I've got an electrolytic capacitor. I know that both of the capacitors inside of this body are good. The 5 microfarad, the 30 microfarad. Now, people might be thinking, that's pretty dangerous. He's actually touching it with his bare hands. I want you to remember that the battery inside of this multimeter is only 9 volts. So there's not a whole lot that can hurt me. But this capacitor could be hooked up to a 370 volt power supply. Unless you know the circuit this is coming from, don't engage in trying to touch both probes. You might be in for a nasty surprise. So that's it. Until next time, stay safe.